My name is Vince Roach. I'm trying to speak so that we'll pick everything up on this microphone, and we're doing a veterans interview, video interview, of Mr. Donald G. Martin on February 23rd, 2006, here in Avon at my office. Uh, Mr. Martin is uh, a veteran of both World War II and Korea, and he's going to fill us in and tell us about his his experiences uh, during those two uh, particular periods of time when this country was engaged in uh, in uh, foreign uh, for foreign wars. Um, just by way of background, Mr. Martin, can you tell us uh, where you were born and your date of birth? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1926, and that date happened to be my mother's birthday also. Right, well, that's a happy coincidence. Yeah. Um, can you, uh, how long have you lived in Avon? I've lived in Avon probably at least 30 years. 30 years. And you're retired? Yes. And what are you retired from? I'm retired as a senior sales engineer for Pierce Pearson Company, who's located in uh, Bloomfield, Connecticut. And what was their product or line? We, we sold pneumatic and hydraulic and electronic equipment used in machinery and uh, robotics and uh, laboratory uh, use and production use quite widely throughout New England. And how long did you work there? I worked there 35 years and another 10 years at home. Okay. Um, You have a family, children? I have two children but they don't live in Connecticut. One lives in uh, Swampscott, Massachusetts, and the other one lives in Kennesaw, Georgia. The, um, we're now going to go back and, uh, just for the record, start, just so it's clear, uh, start with your initial induction or initial experience on what you were doing uh, at the at that period during World War II, when you were uh, either drafted or enlisted or whatever uh, into, uh, I, I think you indicated the Navy. Uh, can you tell us about that? What you were doing, the dates, the times, and the places where you were? Well, I graduated from Clearfield High School in 1943, and uh, almost immediately went to Penn State on the accelerated program. Uh, I enrolled as a industrial engineering student and, and uh, took all the required engineering courses, plus I also had a course in ROTC. Okay, you actually started the freshman year at R- in ROTC, Reserve Officer? Yes. Okay. What, you graduated from, you say, Clearfield High School? Mm-hmm. Where is that located? In Cl- Clearfield, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, okay. It's right on Route 80. All right, Route 80, all right. You have to, if you're going west on Route 80, you go through Clearfield. Okay. And how long were you at Penn State? I was, well, at first I was there 10 months until I was 18 years old and was drafted. Okay. And I was drafted into the Navy because that was my choice. You didn't always get what you wanted, but I was lucky. Okay. Was your commitment there for two years or more than two years? It was for as long as required by the war. Okay, for the duration, as they say. Yes. Okay, drafted in the Navy. Now, um, where did you first get inducted into the Navy? That was in State College, Pennsylvania. Okay, so you were actually on the, uh, on the university grounds was a induction? No, there? no, it was a town. Okay, well, State, yeah, State in College town. is where the college is. But uh, it, where was... Um, uh, where did you first actually get sworn in into the Navy? Was it there? No, it was at uh, Bainbridge, Maryland. Okay, so that was really your first duty station or your first reporting station? Yes, that's where I went to boot camp. Okay, you had boot camp at Bainbridge, Maryland for how long? Probably eight weeks. Okay, okay, and that was basic training? Yeah. And then from there, where did you go? No, well, then uh, we, I think we entered a either 12 or 16 week program uh, 
to learn the uh, requirements of being a Navy hospital corpsman. Okay, and that was your specialized training or special MOS or whatever they called it? Specialized, yes. Uh, in as a Navy corpsman, meaning a medical specialist, a medical yes. person? Yeah, right. Not quite the same as a nurse, but quite similar in many respects. Okay. And uh, did you actually have any hospital or field training going on during that period of time or after that? <laughs> well, after that, I was assigned to the National Naval Medical Center in, in Bethesda, Maryland, and I was a corpsman in the uh, venereal disease ward. All right. <laughs> so you went to, uh, to Bethesda, is that the Bethesda Naval Hospital? Yes. What would they call that today? Mm. Okay, in Bethesda, Maryland. And that was after your 12 or 16 weeks of, of uh, specialized training? Yes. Okay. And how long were you at Bethesda? <laughs> I'm guessing around eight weeks because uh, I, they said that you could uh, apply for a school after you were there four weeks and before I was even able to apply I was on an overseas draft. Okay. <clears throat> overseas draft meaning what? Meaning that we were lined up to be sent overseas for duty. Okay, okay. At this point, when you, let's see, going back, uh, basic eight weeks, specialized training, say 16, and then another eight weeks. Uh, so you you were in the Navy for, say, approximately 30 weeks at that point, or 30 I would, to 36 weeks? I would guess that that's approximately okay, right. Okay, so when did you first go in, when did you first get sworn into the Navy? That would be in 40... 44? Yeah, that would be uh, probably May or June in May or June 1944. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, now getting back to your overseas draft thing, uh, did you have any leave time before you went overseas? I think so. I think so, but I don't, it's not a sharp memory. Yeah. Um, and do you recall approximately when you did actually ship out overseas and to what destination? We had a beautiful train trip across country and ended up in San Bruno, California, where we were assembled and took a train up to Seattle where we took a ship, a merchant ship converted into a uh, transport ship, and uh, we it was called the Mormick Hawk, and uh, we sailed, uh, I believe, to Guam, and I'm not sure whether we went all the way to Tinian or not, but uh, it took about 30 days, and, and our rations were rather sparse, but adequate, and uh, the trip was pretty... Yeah, uneventful, but very slow because it was a, it was a, a, a freighter and it wasn't a fast ship. So you were 30 days at sea from Seattle to get to Guam? Yeah, about that. Well, did you make other stops along the way? Hawaii no. Or? Oh, let's see. We may have stopped in Hawaii, but we didn't get off the ship. That was for sure. You were basically 30 days on that ship? Yeah. <laughs> All right. The, uh, and what kind of a unit were you traveling with then? I mean, was it was it a mixed? It was mixed. Okay, you weren't necessarily. It wasn't your entire unit traveling with you. you no, you mixed no. With all kinds of we didn't know who we were with or or where we were going at that point. Okay, okay. Was uh, were there Marine, Army, and Navy personnel on this ship being transported? As far as I know, there were. Okay. I don't remember how the breakdown, but, you know, we were all passengers in the service. Yeah. What were the accommodations like? Where were you sleeping? We had the bunks. Bunks. Six high? Yeah, pretty high. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, um... I thank God I didn't get seasick. <laughs> of course, Navy people aren't supposed to, are they? But, no. But they do. 
least I found it, some do. But, um, okay, so eventually you get to Guam. You get off at Guam at all? or I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure, but it, but I somewhere along the line I recall being on the ground in Guam, but I don't know when it was. Okay, okay. Um, but that wasn't your final destination? No. And then from Guam or from over that point, I was, you eventually went to Tinian? Tinian, north north to Tinian. North, now, Tinian is what, an island? It's a, it's a fairly large, well, not it was large enough to have B-29s on there. That's where the, the Enola Gay that dropped the first atom bomb took off from. That's right, that's right. That's, that's was Tinian. Tinian, I remember that name. Now. And that's one reason why the military conquered uh, Tinian and Saipan and Guam because they needed room for airfields that could uh, handle a lot of planes. And that could handle the big bombers. Yes, airport, yes. Um, and it also had, uh, had a harbor, obviously, uh, supply harbor or something. Yes. And you basically went into Tinian, and what were you assigned to, or what did you do once you got to Tinian? When we got to Tinian, we were assigned to the United States Military Government Hospital number 204. And uh, our job was to take care of approximately 12,000 Japanese and Korean civilians that were living on the island as farmers or whatever. You say Japanese and Korean? Yes. Koreans the, were on this island? The Koreans were pretty much slaves on Tinian. That's because, now this is after Tinian was taken, the Japanese used the Koreans as slaves? Yeah, seemed to be that way. Uh, seemed to be some residual resentment over that on the part of the Koreans. Today. Oh yeah, there was. <clears throat> so you say there were 12,000, well in effect these people were then kind of prisoners of war then, but they were. They they lived in uh, Camp Churro and they were locked up every night. Both Japanese and Koreans. Yes. Not together though. <laughs> they were together, but I don't know how together they were inside Camp Churro. I don't think I was ever in there. Yeah, that was run by the MPs, probably. Or... Yeah, that was r run by the military government, the Navy military government, I think. Oh really? Could have been various. So what was this hospital like? I mean, were, weren't well, there military personnel in there too? No. You were just taking care of civilians. Right. When we got there, we found the hospital uh, consisted of a bunch of large squad tents. People were on cots uh, in various stages of illness. And uh, eventually the CBs came and put up a hospital for us out of Quonset huts. And we had quite a few of them. But we had probably as good a hospital as you would get in a city around here uh, of ten to 15,000. Mm -hmm. We had almost everything you could name. The, um, was there also a military hospital for military personnel? On N yes, there was, but it wasn't near us. Okay. And, and we didn't, we didn't have anything to do with that, no. What sort of diseases or ailments or illnesses or, or, or conditions were you dealing with as a, as a corpsman? Well, there was a lot of a cat fever, uh, scabies, um, tuberculosis, um, some communicable diseases that aren't common in the United States uh, and then various other typical illnesses of, of children and pregnant women and, and old men. Do you any surgery? Was there a surgery? Yeah, we had a surgical unit, we had x-rays, we had a pharmacy. I, at one point, I was in charge of the receiving ward and uh, I had uh, well, I think three Japanese doctors and a Japanese dentist that we worked with and we also had some Japanese nurses and nurses aides and the nurses aides were in training uh, while they were there because they were basically young girls between I'll say 15 and 20 
for the most part. And you worked with these people? Yes, they worked with they, us. Do they speak English? They learned English. Okay. And the Korean boys were placed in various spots in, in, the, uh, in the hospital where they could be of help. I don't know that they did much medical work, but they were helpful anyway. Yeah. And there wasn't any, any particular problems dealing with the Japanese or the Koreans? We didn't see any. There may have been. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then these, I mean, there were Japanese doctors there as opposed to Navy doctors? We had Navy doctors too. Oh, okay. right. We had Navy doctors and surgeons and laboratory specialists and and we had uh, a doctor from Pittsburgh who was a uh, obstetrician and gynecologist. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, um, what, as far as your rank went, you went from I'm not familiar with Navy ranks. I mean, you went from an E1 to an E2. I mean, what rank were you by the time you got the tenium? Oh, probably just hospital corpsman. But in those days, they call them pharmacist mates, right. and that was a non-commissioned officer. So I went from third-class pharmacist mate to second-class pharmacist mate while I was there. Today, they call them hospital corpsmen. Uh, I think maybe they number them one, two, or three or something like that. Yeah. You don't recall in the, in the pay grades, though. I mean, uh, used to, well, still is. E1 to E9, you know. No, I don't recall that. Yeah, okay. No. Um, the, um, as far as uh, the officers that were in charge of this particular hospital, I mean, were there, was it all, one officer or ten or how? Oh, we that? had about, oh gosh, I think maybe six to eight medical officers. Some were uh, uh, warrant officers. They had two warrant officers in the records office. And then we had probably a half a dozen surgeons and and uh, internists in the other group, and I, we had a we had a um, a navy doctor who was a dentist that took care of us. Okay. Now, how long uh, when you're on Tinian? First of all, how long were you on Tinian? Well, I was on there from. Let's see. Probably August to the following May in 1946. Okay, well, August of 44. You went in. I went. I went in. I was there from August of 44 to probably May of or May or maybe April of 1946, which was after my. Yeah. Well, I wasn't. I didn't have to enlist, so they had me as long as they wanted me. <laughs> okay. But well, I mean, the war was over in August of '45. That's right. But we had to, had to stay. clean up the uh, the place and get uh, uh, all the uh, Japanese and Koreans repatriated to their homeland okay. because they weren't going to stay there. Yeah. yeah. So, the um... the island is now. Uh, inhabited by Chamorro uh, Indians or whatever they were, but they they were native to that area, and they were also in Saipan. Okay, I'm trying to place Tenian. Was Tenian part of uh, the tail of the Japanese Islands? Or no, it was part of the Marianas Islands. Mariana Islands. Islands. Okay, mm -hmm. that was a, that was the chain it was in. Okay, the Marianas. Mm -hmm. So you were there a good nine months after the war ended. At least it seems like. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably true. Okay, May of '46. Uh, um, uh, the um, did your duties change much from being pre-war or during the war to post-war or post August '45? I mean, did you have a different types of duties or? I had a variety of duties. Maybe I was describe what some of those were. Uh, well, I started off as a ward uh, corpsman. And uh, eventually, I worked for the uh, commanding officer for a while. I was his 
do-it-all guy or something. And, uh, and finally, as the older guys with more seniority were repatriated, they put me in the record office. I replaced, <laughs> I think, three record office technicians and two warrant officers. Okay. And I couldn't even type. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I learned. Okay. Okay. Um, and basically then, as you approached, you knew when you were going to, uh, when, when in fact you were shutting down this hospital, and you knew you were going to be shipped home eventually. Yeah. Uh, you had a couple, you had some notice of that of when you were going to uh, That's right. disembark. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you go from Tinian? What happened? Where did you go from Tinian? From Tinian, we took a, a small boat to uh, Saipan, and uh, then we were... Well, then we were put on a transport ship, a fairly large ship. I think it was the, I don't know the name of it now, but it was a pretty large transport ship, a regular uh, a luxury ship. I guess it had been at least. Uh -huh. And uh, we sailed all, all the way through the Panama Canal to New York City and got out there. Oh, you went down through the canal, huh? Mm hmm To New York. And then uh, uh, in New York, you were discharged. No. Okay. What happened in New York? Well, we were sent home uh, to our home, and uh, and from there we and with papers of when to report for discharge. Okay. And my papers were involved the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. That's when, that's where I was discharged. Okay. So from New York. You went home, and then you had to report to uh, the Philadelphia Naval? Yes, after a period of days. I don't know how long. You had to leave at home, and then... Uh, yeah, right. And then to uh, the Philadelphia Naval Hospital there. That's a big hospital there, isn't it? Mm. The, uh, and then, uh, I mean, shortly after that, you were discharged? Yeah, I was discharged there. Do you, do you know your discharge today? No, but it's on my DD-214. I think it was like May 26th or something like that. May 26th, okay. Um, Is the DD-214 going to be part of this yes, research? Actually, and I was going to bring a copy today, but I forgot. Actually, I do, they, 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 want you, you know, they want me to get a copy. All right, I'll they get want, you a copy. You know, your, your convenience. I just want to check here. Oh. Yeah, things look good, I hope. Everything's taking. Uh, Who knows? I had Who knows? one one experience on Tinian you might be interested in. I don't know whether you want me to go in any detail. Yes, I do. And matter of fact, that's a good point. Before we jump now, go into the Korean theater, let's go back and tell me about anything, any experience, Tinian or before Tinian, mm -hmm. anything that you think is, is, is uh, remarkable or noteworthy. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, fill me in on that. Well... You know, in the hospital, we dealt with uh, a variety of people, uh, mostly Japanese, and and uh, we got to know some of them quite well. In fact, I met my best friend there. He was a a, a Nisei that was born on in Hawaii, and he was our interpreter. And his name was Clarence Suzuki, and I just saw him a few weeks ago out in Las Vegas. Now, a Nisei is, is a Japanese-American? Yes. Okay. Just so people know. Um, He's quite proud of the Japanese-Americans' effort in World War II. Absolutely. There was a whole, I think, I want to say, a brigade, maybe even a division. Yeah, the 552. 552. Was that the name? They fought in Italy, mostly, in the right. European theater. Right. right. Yeah, they had a right. I remember reading some of that. Uh, one little experience we had, besides offering guidance uh, uh, to the Japanese in, in the hospital was uh, one afternoon two of us decided we wanted to do a little exploring. You know how 19-year-old boys are. So uh, we saw this hill and we decided to walk up this hill and get a better look of the island. And 
while I was walking up the hill, I came upon a little dugout area, and on this area there was a Japanese soldier sleeping in uniform with his gun and bayonet and hand grenades all handy, and uh, he was sleeping, and I was only about eight feet away from him, <laughs> but I figured I wasn't armed, and if all he had to do was turn around, grab a hand grenade, and throw it downhill. So I, we ran out of there as fast as we could, but that was quite a surprise. That would be. Now, Kenny and the Woods, of, uh, taking, the taking of that island was by the Marines. Right. And there was, there was a pretty good fight. Taking oh, yeah. Island, as I recall. Yeah. Not as good as in Saipan, but oh no, but, I mean, but it was it was a few days. Um, um, the uh, but this one, I mean, when they did the, the sweep and the mop up, they missed the they probably missed some of these guys that were dug in. Oh yeah, well it was a hilly area. There was you know. Did they eventually go up and get this guy? Or I don't you? know. We didn't. I don't know if we told anybody about him. We I guess I figured that he'd survived that far and hadn't caused any problems. I'd just leave him alone. Leave him alone. <laughs> Probably maybe still there. <laughs> <laughs> no, they found some of those prison, some of those Japanese soldiers years afterwards. Oh, the Philippines, they were. Yeah, they and were on, I did. think on Saipan and Guam too. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The. Um, as far as recreation time, I mean, what would you do with time off? I mean, oh, we had uh, we had a very good softball team. I, for a small outfit, I don't know if we had a hundred guys or not, but we had a couple guys that were really good pitchers, and some of the kids had had played semi-pro ball, you know, and we played a lot of big outfits, and that was our big uh, thrill of of sports in, in, on Tinian. Now, we've had volleyball, I think, and tennis, and and uh, we could go swimming in the in the ocean. We had a we could go to the beach there. Nice beach, good water. Oh yeah, nice and clean. Yeah. Coral reefs around. Yeah. And one day we went fishing with uh, uh, a Japanese fisherman on a LST. LST, a smaller one. And uh, we caught some wahoo, and that was quite exciting. I, I had a, a, a line as big as a clothesline and uh, got hooked something that was so big I couldn't pull it in, and then the line broke. Shark. Maybe. It was a big thing, because it had to be. But the wahoo uh, was a beautiful fish, and we got a whole probably a dozen of them. Ooh. Let me go back and just so you fully identified your unit. What what was the formal designation of your unit there on Tinian? Uh, the formal designation was United States Navy Military Hospital number 204. 204, okay. All right. The, uh, did you ever serve in any other uh, military hospitals uh, outside of Bethesda and that? Well, not until the Korean War. Okay, then that changed. Okay, we won't get into that yet. But okay, um, any other incidents that you want to kind of bring to mind or that come to mind uh, uh, that you might want to talk about during the World War II experience? I mean, were anybody in, anybody in your unit? Uh, Injured or uh, a casualty, a hostile fire, or any other? Impact? No, no, we didn't ha run into any hostile fire. We had an occasional prisoner being brought in, and and uh, he was checked out by the uh, doctors, uh, but they didn't pose any problems for us. Did Jap Japanese prisoners understand and appreciate what was being done for them, or were they anyway hostile to you? I mean, uh, well. At the beginning, the people were all farmer types. They were not intelligent professionals for the most part. And they were told that we were going to kill them. So a lot of them were jumping off the cliffs into the ocean. And and this dentist, uh, uh, the, his, name is, his name is on the tip of my tongue. But... Uh, he uh, he broadcast from 
ships going along shore. Don't jump where you won't hurt you and that sort of thing. And probably saved a couple hundred lives that way. But uh, you know when you practically live with these people and you see the little kids and you realize that um, there's a lot of uh, sentimental humanity that exists between Americans and Japanese or whatever because little kids were universally, I think, uh, adored and loved the same as they are anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Um, before we go into the Korean theater, uh, you're wearing uh, your, your, some of your medals, or medals that are you know, part of uh, these uh, military experiences. Can you just briefly summarize what those, some of those medals are, and do they all relate to World War II, do some relate to the Korean theater? Well, I think, well, I think this is good conduct. This one is good conduct, and this is a European the uh, American theater. This is an Asiatic Pacific theater. Um, and these are uh, Korean medals, UN medals, and this one I think was given by the president of Korea to the 1st Marine Division. Okay, so the top ones are more Korean and the bottom ones World War II? Yeah, that's pretty much it. They, they keep coming out with commemorative medals. Oh, yeah. But the, I think they're mostly for show and not yeah. official military medals. These are all now, regular imagine medals. Imagine the case in your hat that you remember the VFW. Tell us what post that is. In the, uh, well, I'm in post 3272 in Avon. And uh, how long have you been a member there? About five years. Okay. The, um, how big is that post? We have about 150 members right now. We're one of the larger posts in in okay. Connecticut, and larger and more active, I should say, because we get pretty good turnout for our meetings. Yeah, yeah. Maybe because they're dinner meetings, the the, the auxiliary women prepare the meals. <laughs> Although one day we don't have any young women. <laughs> They're all over 70. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, wives of veterans. <clears throat> yeah, well, a lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah. And you also have a book of pictures, approximately about 20 of them. We'll get into those, all of them relating... Well, no, they're not all. Do they all relate to Korea? Or some? you got some World War Two? No, those are all Korea. Those are all Korea, yeah. I had a lot of a lot of uh, photographs of uh, of Tinian, but you know how they get after 50 years, they're yeah. like curled. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got a lot of pictures of Japanese girls and yeah. so forth. Uh, I had one girl I liked a lot, but I don't, her father was a member of the Black Dragon Society and she, they were not allowed to fraternize with us at all. Really? There was yeah. nothing going on between any of us and them. But if you work with somebody a long time, you why you build up a friendship. Sure. sure. <clears throat> she was from Japan. She wasn't a native Tinian, or whatever. she was actually from Okinawa. Okinawa. Huh. Oh, okay. Well, that's a Japanese island, I guess. Right. Yeah. Most of them were from Okinawa. Yeah. Um. They had a sugar cane industry there in in Okinawa. In in Tinian. Oh, Tinian. How big was Tinian? I don't know, maybe 10, 12 miles long and three or four miles wide. Okay. Okay. Um, why don't we take a pause here for a minute? Back on the record now. Uh, we're just going to go back. Um, Mr. Martin is just going to tell us a little bit about his good friend Clarence and uh, how he knew him and how he's maintained that relationship. Can you just briefly, hmm. briefly tell us something about that? Kick the camera. We're okay. <laughs> Too many legs here. Yeah, could you just fill us in on that? He was a Japanese American? Yeah, and he was in the Army, and, and uh, after uh, 
after he left uh, Tinian, he was assigned to uh, to Japan, where they were trying to uh, investigate the communists in Japan because that they f our government figured they were a threat to us. Mm -hmm. So he spent some time there before he was discharged. What did he do in the army? What was his? He was an interpreter. Oh, interpreter, okay. But he wanted to be a doctor, so he fit in pretty good. He was very interested in all things medical and so forth. Did he become a doctor? No, he went into uh, more chemistry. Okay. And uh, you kept contact with him over the years? Yeah. Yep, I saw I saw him in Hawaii probably two or three times. Yeah. In the last ten years. More than that. Yeah. Yeah. When was the last time you saw him? Oh, I just saw him a couple of weeks ago out in Las Vegas. Well, Las Vegas, okay, that's what you mentioned. <laughs> well, that was off the record, but yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and his name was Clarence. What was his name? Suzuki. Suzuki. Okay. Right. That's it. Pretty common Japanese name, I guess. Yeah, it is. Yeah. He's related to the Suzuki motorcycle. Yeah. Um, and then coming back through, when you're coming back out of Tenney and through the Panama Canal back to New York, you ran into somebody you said you knew. Yeah, I, he was my first roommate in uh, in college, and uh, he was in the uh, in the Army Medical Corps, and he was an officer, and he was assigned to uh, the Army Hospital in I think Cristobal, Panama. And he got in a jeep and came to our ship, and we visited for a while there. That was a, a good reunion. And I used to see him at the Penn State reunions. In fact, the last year he was there. Okay. Mm. That's great. Well, okay. We're all over 80 now. All the World War II guys that I know are all over 80. I don't know. I can't think of any World War II guy I know that's under 80. Well, there are not. Well, I mean, one as well. He's close to 80. Well, 79. I was just 80 in this January. Yeah. Okay, at this point, we're going to shift our focus. Uh, World War II is over. You've been discharged from the Navy. Fill us in briefly what you did from 46 to the Korean War and then how you wound up in Korea and all that. Uh, what you went, uh, what you did. Oh, you okay. Oh, okay. After I was discharged, I went back to college, and I had five semesters uh, of industrial engineering to complete. Um, I worked uh, two summers, uh, uh, one in Pittsburgh as an industrial engineer trainee, and another time in Niagara Falls as a factory worker. And... Uh, that was to earn a little money to supplement the uh, government money that we got. You got the v, uh, VA benefits, VA educational GI bill. Yep, and that was a big thing. Oh yeah, very big thing. And you and you uh, then graduated from Penn State. Yeah, I graduated in uh, January of '49. January of '49, and uh, during that period, were you in any reserve units or any affiliation? I was signed up in the reserves. Because I went to that one meeting okay. where we signed up because they were going to have an organized reserve unit at Penn State, and I thought, well, that would be a good thing to do to make a little extra money, but they, it never got it organized. And uh, So you were in the kind of, so to speak, during that latter 40, you know, after World War II, you were in kind of an inactive reserve status? Or? That's right, inactive. <laughs> it was very inactive. Yeah. <laughs> it was nothing. Right. <clears throat> yeah, um, and then um, at some point, forty nine, you graduated. Did you you started a job somewhere? And then then I tried to. It was a very bad time to graduate because there was hard to get a job, and and uh, I finally got a job with Ingersoll Rand because a friend of mine that graduated, he got a job with Ingersoll Rand and told me about it, and it was. Just what I wanted. Uh, well, it was a big company then. Yeah, and uh, compressors. Yeah, he, 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 he was in air tools, and that's what I was in. Yeah. And uh, 
But at the time, I was hired out in Detroit, and I replaced the high school graduate. <laughs> And, but I got good experience uh, learning more about the ins and outs of office work in a sales office. Mm -hmm. And eventually I was about ready to get a promotion to a sales engineer and uh, that's when I got called back in the service. Okay. You know, so kids these days they ask, you know, if you had any upsets in your life. But you had a lot of them, but you just accepted it. But uh, Kids today, they they don't have to deal with that problem. I know. I know. And uh, anyway, anyway, uh, I I liked the work, and I was assi I worked in New York City in the Eleven Broadway for them for a couple months, and and then they sent me up to Hartford, and I worked in Connecticut as a sales engineer for Ingersoll Rand for a few years. Okay, now we're talking now. Are we, are we, this is now still before Korea. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you came back. To, then, then. No, this isn't. No, I was in Hartford after Korea. After okay. So you yeah. went to New York though for a brief period with them before Korea. Or was that after too? Ah, uh, that was after. after okay. Mm -hmm. Let's let's stay with now. Your 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 you have a job leading up through forty nine into fifty. Korean War breaks out. When do you get? Called back in. How I, all I was called back when I worked for in for Ingersoll Rand in Detroit, and I was working in the office there, and uh, as a as an as a clerk. And when I got called back, that was September 1950. September 50, you get called back into an active duty Navy unit. No, I was had to report to uh, where was it? I don't know. Maybe it, it, some. I think it maybe it might it might have been Philadelphia Naval Hospital. I'm not sure. Okay. That's where I had to report. I think. Uh, and then, uh, then that's when they put me in the Marine Corps. Okay. Now this this sudden change this, uh, this requires maybe a little explanation of you're you're reinducted or, or so to speak uh, recalled back into the Navy mm. as an active corps as a corpsman with with the same rank. Yeah. Okay, so you're going in as probably an E three or maybe an E four. Well, I was like a staff sergeant. Staff sergeant. Well, that'd be uh, an E five, E five, E six. Maybe. And the nice thing about the Marine Corps, because when you're a staff sergeant, you're a staff NCO, and you, and you have a lot of extra privileges. Absolutely. And, and you Marines, don't in the Navy. The Navy, no. You're not a chief until you're an E seven in the Navy. That's right. You know, and uh, the petty officers are, are still, you know, they're not chiefs. Uh, no, but, no, uh, but uh, but I in the Marine Corps, the, uh, a staff sergeant is is, is pretty cr up there. And, and that's the rank that you. That's what I went in with, and that's what I come out with. Yeah. Now, uh, just so you, uh, you you think you went into the uh, Navy or uh, Philadelphia Naval Hospital, at what point did you realize, or when were you told that you're going to not be in the Navy, you're going to be in the Marine Corps? Which is, of course, I don't remember that. Okay. It might have been, it must have been pretty early on, because uh, we didn't really have to go through any indoctrination like boot camp or anything. We just were put in uh, field medical service school in Camp Lejeune. Okay, so that's where you, I mean, basically you were ordered to Lejeune and there you were then, so to speak, in the Marine Corps. I mean, Lejeune's a Marine camp. Right, right. Okay, so that was... I mean, reactivated. That happened shortly thereafter. That you must have been sent to Lejeune for further training. Right, right. Okay. Now, what? How long were you at Lejeune? Oh, um, probably two or three months, I think. And what was your training there? Oh well, we learned about the problems in uh, that we would encounter being in the field medical service school. Yeah. And uh, being a corpsman with Marine unit, yeah. you know, uh, but Marine, so uh, Marine way, huh? yeah, well, right. No, uh, I know that we went to the firing range, and I was a pretty good shot, so I got expert. Oh, yeah. 
I got expert and that was easy and I didn't even have wear my glasses in those days. <laughs> but uh so you had rifle training then, huh? Well all yeah, training, Well we had we had a, a, a day at the shooting range, that's yeah. all. And uh, so you were a staff sergeant at that point with some rank. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I went to the, uh, we used to go to the staff NCO club, which was, you know, like an officer's club. Yes. And uh, they had a, what was her name? Edie Gourmet was there one night, and I asked her to dance, and I danced with her. Really? Really? Danced with Edie Gourmet, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was only about 18 or 19 at that time. She was pretty young. Not a bad-looking woman, as I recall, though. No. Well, she married that Lawrence. You know, what was this? Yeah, uh, Edie Gourmet. She sang with a guy, uh, his name had, I don't know if it was Lawrence, her last name was Lawrence. Yeah. They were famous. They girl. got married. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, then you were at Lejeune for, you say, what? Eight, well, how many, eight weeks? I, yeah, I think eight weeks in the in the school, and then I was assigned to the second tank battalion as a corpsman. That was that with you? Yeah, and that's where I met two of my good friends. We're both from Burlington, Vermont. Huh. <laughs> really? And they we, were Marines uh, in the tank? Uh, yeah, they were corpsmen. Well, they were corpsmen, too, okay. They were corpsmen. Uh, and one was the third class, and the other one was the second class. Oh, well, they were in the Navy. They were in the Marines. Oh, Marines, okay. And they got assigned with me to go uh, overseas. Okay, good. Let me go uh, now. After you finished your training at Lejeune, how long were you at Lejeune after that? Did you stay there long? No. No, maybe, as I say, I think uh, maybe three or four months. Three or four months. So you went in September of fifty. So by December of fifty, yeah, January fifty one, you were shipped out. No, I think I think we got in Korea in December. That's what I okay. think. And you were uh, okay. So you left Lejeune with this. Did you leave them. Leave with this tank battalion or whatever. No. No. You just left this corpsman. The three of you were well, over. Just were you assigned to a particular unit at that time? No. no. You were just given no. individual assignments. Right. To report into somewhere. I don't know whether they had it figured out already, but I, you know. Yeah. But I know when, when I got to Korea, we relieved corpsmen from Charlie Med that came down from the Chosen Reservoir. And these were the remnants of what was left. The Chosen. Uh, that was left of that unit. And so Charlie Med had to build up their strength before they were able to operate. And uh, a lot of the guys here that were were there, they escaped frostbite and, and all being wounded and all that stuff. So these were the guys that were the luckier ones. Yeah, well, that chosen reservoir was a brutal one. Oh yeah, they, these guys went through a lot. Well, let's let's go back now. You're, okay, so you're, you're shipped out of Lejeune. Uh, how do you wind up in Korea? What, what, what's your route? Well, we were. Oh yeah, we we flew over. Flew. Yeah, we flew from. Uh, it was a Navy air base in California. Okay, you get from Lejeune to the Navy. How did you get there? Train. We took the train cross country. Okay, train to wherever the place was in the... Yeah, that was a beautiful trip. I mean, the 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 accommodations weren't the greatest, but we saw a lot of beautiful country. Cross country, huh? Hmm. Uh, what, you go through the Rockies, huh? Yeah. From the train to California. You don't know where in California you disembarked from? Yeah, well, I know we were assigned to stay at San Bruno, California. They had a... That... It was a... It was a horse racing track, and the Navy took it over, <laughs> and, and a lot of the guys slept in in stalls. <laughs> but we happened to stay in a in a barracks, fairly new temporary barracks. That was in San Bruno. San Bruno, California. Was that on the water? 
No. Where was that near, though? What's San Bruno near me? Was it, well, it was near Stanford, I know that. Oh, it's up, okay, so it's north of San Francisco. Or no, no, it was south. Stanford is down south. South, it was yeah. south. Okay. And we used to spend vacations, I mean, uh, uh, liberties in San Francisco. And, they, and one day in San Francisco, I was walking up Market Street, and I ran into my uncle. He was in the Navy, and... <laughs> <laughs> he was out there, my Uncle John. Okay, yeah, that was a really... You didn't know he was out there? No, I don't think I did. You saw him on the street or something? Yeah, we just walked into each other. It's amazing. Yeah, so I had a reunion with him. So that time you were you were wearing, though, a Marine uniform, a Marine Staff Sergeant uniform, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, you get into this <coughs> in San Bruno, you're there for how long? period? Three weeks, baby. Three weeks, and then you're preparing to ship out. Then we got on the Marianas Mars airplane, huge flying boat, and we flew to uh, Hawaii. Mariana Mars, that was a large, what, a large... A large flying boat, boat. Transport yeah. Boat, or transport uh, plane? Plane, yeah, big one. It was probably the largest one of, that at was the a time. Army Air Corps? No, it was naval. It was a Navy plane. And he went yeah. from there... To, uh, some air base to, uh, to Hawaii. To Hawaii, okay. In fact, that's where I saw Clarence and Thelma again. And they met me at the airport, and she brought a flowered lei for me to wear. And, and uh, I think he had his car, and we drove around the island a little bit, oh. you know. And well, they were living there then, huh? They were living there. He wasn't reactivated, though. No. He was out. No, he was out. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so you saw your... Yeah. Suzuki. Uh, yep. Yeah. Suzuki. Uh, okay, so you were in Hawaii for a little bit. Not yeah, maybe a uh, couple days. Yeah. And then we we flew from there. I think to uh, yeah, from there we flew to Korea. Right into yeah. uh, into southern Korea. And the Pus Pus uh, Maison is where we landed. Maison. It was where we were met up with our unit, or our unit to be. You weren't assigned any unit at that point. <coughs> I might have been, but I didn't realize it at the you time. You weren't traveling with a group. You were traveling kind of alone. Or yeah, I was with a bunch of guys. And, yeah. and one of the guys that I met in Camp Lejeune was in my unit, and the other guy was in another unit. Yeah. The one from Bur The two were both from Burlington. In fact, they were friends of yours. Yeah. Um, and you kept contact with them still. Yeah, I did. I I was in contact with them. Uh, I had a couple trips, business trips, up to Burlington, and and I saw Miles McQuinn. And uh, later on, I contacted uh, Clint Hutchinson, who was there, and. Uh, and I arranged for he to for him to go to Montreal with me, and then we met Clarence and Thelma up there, <laughs> and we had a nice visit with them. And Clarence and Clint were both history buffs, and they had a lot in common. And Clint was a, a wonderful guy. I wish he had, he died shortly after that. Oh, really? So and, uh, he was a fellow that could do a lot of things. That yeah. He was a dowser, he was Reiki. He said, I can, I can do Reiki over the telephone to you. He was into that that much. Yeah, oh, yeah, and he knew a lot of stuff I'd like to have learned, but he died too soon. Yeah, I, unfortunately, the good ones do. Yeah, he was, he devoted his whole life to uh, doing good things. He was involved in some sort of... Oh, he was like a guidance counselor and uh, in high school, and he taught history, and he worked in prisons for helping prisoners, and he, uh, his, his father died, and he helped his mother run a boarding house in Burlington, and he was a very benevolent type of guy. Good person. Very unusual person. Yeah. Very nice guy. Yep. Never got married. I don't know. 
Yeah. Like, you like to see people like that because I mean, there's so few of them around. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, even my wife Barbara, she liked, thought the world of him, and she wishes that we'd now got to know him better. But you know, you do things as they come to your mind, and sometimes you wish you'd done it sooner, but you couldn't do it. Yep. The uh, okay, let's get in. So you're in the Korea in December of '50. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, well, what do you what do you, unit are you assigned to, and what happened? This is. Uh, we were assigned to uh, uh, Charlie Med Field Hospital. Okay, Charlie Med. I mean Charlie C. C. Med. I mean that's a like a mash unit. Large, large field hospital. Not large. Oh no. No. Okay. Not large. They just call it C. Med. Charlie Med. But we had a couple. We had a few doctors, American Navy doctors. And you had also air transport, helicopter, or whatever. You know, uh, I don't never. I don't think I was ever on a helicopter there, but but they had them available. Well, the the helicopters used to bring the wounded in. into us, and uh, but you know that we hadn't really set up yet though, because we were just getting all of our gear together to get a hospital going in Korea, yeah. and. Uh, after we got all that, it was all put on trucks, and we drove north, I think, to Taegu, but I'm not sure. Was it like central? central or yeah, that was more central. Central South Korea. Yeah. And we set up a hospital there. Okay. How, how many people would be in a hospital unit? I mean, what are you talking about, the total staff? I mean, 50, 50? 50, 50, maybe. 50 personnel. Yeah. But there weren't specific helicopters assigned to you, I mean, marine helicopters or... They weren't assigned to us. I mean, they no. were assigned to somebody else. Yeah, they were... They had to be working. They were part of, you know, they had ambulances and jeeps and everything yeah. that brought but it was, wounded to us. But those hospitals, at least this one in Korea, was a total marine operation. It wasn't a joint operation with Army, Navy... No, Army it was Air totally Corps. marine. And even the doctors were in the Marine Corps, under the auspices of the 1st Marine Division. Actually, he was a Navy captain, but he was, this, I don't know what his rank was in the Marine Corps, but, yeah. but there was over a thousand corpsmen in, in a Marine Division. So it was pretty that was all, uh, your title or the rank was 1st Marine Division, then CMET or was something in between? Was there a brigade assignment? I mean, it was division. Oh no, we we were we were served in the area. We weren't the only one. There must have been other other medical battalions or yeah. or, or units, I should say, not battalions. Did you did you serve though and take care of only marine wounded? Y yes, okay. yes. Army had its own setup. Yeah. Okay. The um. Okay, so let's see, uh, by January of 51, you, this hospital had, unit had moved up into Taegu and... Well, I like to think that, yeah. sometime like January, yeah. Early, uh, the winter was setting in there, it was cold there then, right? Oh yeah, it was cold, well, we, were, we had all the winter gear on. Yeah, and... Yeah. Uh, and we had big squad tents with a oil heater in it. That yeah. You slept in big days. Yeah, and I worked nights so I could sleep during the day when it was warmer. <laughs> what, now, what was your job there? <clears throat> I was assigned as, uh, I don't know if I was really in charge, but I was one of the corpsmen in charge of the receiving ward. Okay. And that's where I got in trouble. Because one day we had a lot of casualties and there were bandages all over them, the floor and everything, you know. And uh, the chief says to me, clean up these things, why didn't you clean them up? I said, chief, we were engulfed by patients. We didn't have time to clean them up. Yep. He, he didn't like that answer. And... Uh, well, he knew what was going on, he should have known, right? He should have, but... I don't know, maybe he thought I was a smart ass or something. But uh, about two or three days later, I was in a line company. Oh, really? 
Huh? That was set up closer to the front, you mean? Where was yeah. the front at this point? I mean, was well, it, it was 38 or? Well, no, it was south of that then. Oh, yeah. Because we hadn't, we hadn't gone up to 38th yet. Okay, well, I mean... Uh, well, this was the second time around. You know, when they went up to the, the up Yellow the River, that was the time the Chinese, Chinese came in and threw us all back. But back. that was before I got there. Okay, okay. Had Inchong Landing <laughs> occurred? Yeah, it had occurred. It had occurred, so it was in the... Broke that Chinese attack, or frontal wave down pushed them back, and now they've been pushed back to the 38th again, so All right. the second return. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. In fact, after we set up this hospital there, near Taigu is what I, is what I say, uh, that, that apparently the Chinese broke through our lines and we had to evacuate and go back down south somewhere again. Yeah. And, and uh, we were there a while, and then we went back up north again. Were you, at that point, out of the hospital and in this line unit? No, okay. not that, you not not unit. then yet. No. Okay. So what happened after you went to this line? What was the line unit like? I mean, it was a regular combat company. Or oh yeah, battalion? it was. It was a yeah, third third battalion. We were in. Well, I remember the first. The first day out, I was with a. About three or four of us were, marching up to join our unit and uh, I know I was getting kind of tired because I hadn't been walking much you know right. you and uh, I know I know my head fell over to the side my helmet fell off and it was so steep it rolled completely out of sight oh my God. so so uh, I had to go without a helmet for a little while but then we joined, I think, the company, which had a lot of guys in it, and we were walking north. And a couple short, maybe four short rounds from our own artillery hit our line. But the line was so long, they were way ahead of where I was, you know, so I wasn't called into play then. Uh, but then we made a... Uh, we made the camp on the way up, and a couple of North Korean mortar shells fell in our group and wounded a couple guys, and I, I helped that. I helped one guy get settled. And, uh, and then uh, we just, and that's, yeah, that was, that was when I was assigned to the Line company, yeah, and uh, that was a regular combat company, right? You were assigned to a company or a battalion company, probably. Yeah, there were two companies. I know I was in George and Howe Company. Yeah. I know of that. G and H, yeah. Yeah, and they were basically facing North Korean Chinese troops. And right. how long were you assigned there? Um. Well, don't forget, I was a second class. And they didn't have those guys in line companies. So I was probably, well, maybe a month, month or so, mm -hmm. including up to the time we went to the punch bowl. But then they got a third class come along, and he took my place, and I was sent to the rear. Oh, that's a big advantage there. Oh, right. right. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, he, they... North Koreans infiltrated one night and he was shot up and they shot up the whole CP command, the platoon command post and he was in the hospital in Japan hmm. but uh, I was back in battalion aid then. I was at battalion aid and regimental aid and, and then finally we got our numbers up from being in Korea and so forth and, and uh, I was eligible to be uh, repatriated, at least sent to the rear. Yeah. Well, I went, this is, you, you always got to try. I went to, and talked to the division surgeon, who was the guy in charge of all the Koreans, all the, all the corpsmen. And I said, well, 
if we can be sent to the rear, how about sending us to the Armored Amphibious Battalion in Japan? And by God, he did. Because <laughs> you were all your No, I have a picture of the guys that went there. Okay. Well, okay, just to digress for a minute, you have this book of pictures, which are mostly the Korean experience. Yeah. Now, those are pictures of artillery and units. These line units that you were assigned to in those pictures, for the most part, I mean, uh, mm, well, some are and some are. Well, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to go back, back later off the, off the record and get more definition and, and uh, uh, description of, of what those pictures are about. But basically, most of them are, are Korean, your Korean experience. In that yeah, they all are. All are, okay. Yeah. We'll go back to those later. Um, okay, so once you're... You were with this line unit for like, what, 30 days, 60 days? Mm. If that. Maybe 30, maybe 30 days, and then I was sent to the rear, to, to the battalion rear. aid or something like yeah, that, but never went back to Charlie Med. Okay. So you're back at the rear with, at battalion level, you know, some sort of a field. Yeah, and I think I was at regimental aid, too, but, you know, they were just a couple tents. They didn't handle a lot of casualties or anything. Yeah, but I, I'll tell you one bad experience I had. One day, uh, and I don't remember, this was battalion age or regimental aid, they brought a whole truckload of dead Marines in. And the corpsman or the officer in charge says, okay, you unload those guys. Lay them out. So I had to drag these kids that were just killed and lay them up on the bank where the graves registration could look at them, get their dog tags and all that kind of stuff. And that was kind of sad because these were young. I mean, I was, I was maybe 19 at the time. And these guys looked like 17, 18. They looked like babies. Wait, wait a minute. You were older than 19 because you had, I mean, you got out of high, you were in World War II. And that's right, that's right. Yeah, I was like 26. You had to be like in there 20. Yeah, I was like 25 or 26, okay. yeah. But 1950, yeah, I was, yeah, I was 24. Yeah, like 24. 24 right. I turned 25 over there. Um, yeah, that's right. I was 24. So. You'd seen a little, you were a little older and seen a little. Yeah, I, and, you know, I, I could talk to the younger Marines m m more as somebody that they would respect. Yeah, sure. You know, they call me Doc. In fact, over even, even in the VFW, they call them, some of them call me Doc, you yeah, know, yeah, to yeah, this yeah. day. So the guys that are, were Marines, they they really loved the corpsmen, you know. Yeah, well, sure. They were all, they were, they were dependent on Corman and, and just the name was so good but we'd tease back and forth with the Marines you know and, yeah but it was all in fun but that was a bad that was so there was a number of bodies you had to take off this deuce and a half or off this truck and had to get yeah well, about 12 or 13 they were just killed yeah you could tell you see the wounds and no, I don't know I that I saw anything in particular it was ghastly but you know they were just so fresh yeah no question they were dead, though. No, oh, they were dead, all right. Yeah, they were dead. They were big guys, you know. You try to handle a guy who weighs 180 pounds, dead weight, that's something. Well, you had help. Somebody else got the guy. No, I didn't. You were to do this all alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that officer, I don't remember anybody helping me. <laughs> well, I was the big of that officer. <laughs> you didn't order anybody to help you. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I got them all laid out. And, but I never forgot that because it brings to life uh, yeah. what happens. Although I was never in combat where I saw people getting killed, yeah, getting so shot. Was, see, close enough though. Wow. The um, so then from there, I mean, you got the rear, and then you were in the rear with these with that sort of assignment for what thirty, sixty days or so, and I don't know. That was. Uh, That was probably maybe 30 days or something like that. And then from there... And then, then we, we got rotated to the rear, 
in Japan. Okay, then you shipped to Japan. You went from Korea to Japan. Yeah. Okay, how'd you get there? By ship? No, by plane. The plane, they flew you in Japan. Where in Japan did you go? Where were you stationed? I think it was called uh, Otsu. It was near Yakuska. Yakuska? Yakuska. Yakuska was near, outside of, it was a little south of uh, Tokyo. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking of something. That was a naval base there, Yakuska. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And what did you do there? Well, we were surplus. They had guys to work there. Yeah. So so all we had to do was, uh, was uh, meet muster in the morning and we were free to go. <laughs> so you were you could go into town or go to Tokyo? Or well, something? we could do anything we want. Oh, well, you know, and that's, uh, I mean, how many people were like in this status? I mean, what was... You well, know, you know, Bob, I guess most of our group was. Oh, yeah? This, this one boy in there, Bob Bailey, he he was uh, my buddy and and he he was in the same line company I was. He was the senior corpsman in that one. <clears throat> and we so what got, are you talking about, 10 guys in that picture that were there? Yeah, maybe eight or nine. Yeah, they all went to that. All went there, and uh, we had a good time. I'll tell you. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. Stay away from that venereal disease. But <laughs> oh yeah, you got to be careful. That. Although I don't know that we were as careful as we could have been. Yeah. Well, you, you had some experience with that at Bethesda. It sounded like. <laughs> oh yeah, I used to have to. You know, uh, I had to give the guys shots. Penicillin. And when and the penicillin in those days was very thick, yeah. so we had to use big needles with big holes in them. <laughs> God, you that boom, and you get that big needle in them, and you know, <laughs> these guys would jump. <laughs> but it didn't hurt me. <laughs> but you had to do it. The nurses didn't do it. No. No, Carmen did the whole thing. Oh. The nurses, you know, nurses who probably didn't have any more education than we had, yeah. they were officers. That's right. Well, most of them, that's right. RNs would be, yeah. Yeah. They were maybe a little older than we are, maybe yeah. a year or two, but not a lot of years. But they were all officers. But we had guys that were medical students and uh, registered pharmacists and laboratory technicians and yeah. and x-ray technicians and all that, and they weren't. They didn't get a commission. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, I know they made nurse, nurses. Well, if you were an RN, you were an officer. Yeah. That's right. And it might be low, you know, ones that weren't RNs. Right? And they were, they were really, they really kept the officers happy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened between them, but I'm sure that at least they had a chance to talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they had their own mess and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the way it was. But, uh, the, uh, okay, so you're in outside of Tokyo. This this is a Navy base. Uh, yes, mm. okay, whatever it is. Hmm. Navy how, base. How long were you there? Well, I'm, you know, I'll say I'll say a month. Oh, one month. Okay. Yeah, but you know, it might not have, might have only been two weeks. But okay. Well, then where did you go from there? Well, then then we got our orders to go home and and. Uh, Finally, they arrived, and we got on a plane and flew to, uh, or no, that's when we got the ship. That's when we got the ship. You were sent home by ship? Uh, well, I'm getting the two wars mixed up here. It's easy to do. I know. Um, no, because I got a picture of the ship going under going under the Golden Gate Bridge. So we were on a ship. And uh, and we went to Treasure Island in San Francisco. Okay, on a ship, okay. Yeah, and uh, we stayed there. Uh, seemed like a long time, because a lot of the guys that went, landed with us and went there, they got papers before we did, long before we did, but well, we were having a good time, so it didn't matter too much. But finally, you know, when we were in Korea, there was a Navy uh, admiral came, and he talked to us, 
And he told us, he says, if there's anything I can ever do for you, let us know. Let me know. So after we were there quite a while, and it seemed like they'd screwed up with the paperwork, we sent him a wire. And by God, we, in about a week, we got our papers. Okay, let me go back just to get this in the right time frame. You got into Korea in, in the winter, December of 50. Mm-hmm. When did you leave Korea? When did you actually get shipped to Japan? You must have been. It must have been in the in the spring or summer of fifty one. You were in Korea. You were. How long were you in Korea? I'm trying to. Oh, we were, must have been there pretty close to a year. Oh, you were there for a year. Oh, okay. I'm trying to. Pretty mind close to back a year. Here. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a year the way we were talking, but so no. you were there from December to December. You think? Maybe to November. November of fifty one. Mm. Okay, and then to Japan, there for maybe uh, 30, 60 days? Nah, not, the, not 60, but yeah. not 30. 30 days, and yeah. then Japan to California? To Treasure Island. Island mm. There for a short period? Yeah, maybe a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, what, back to your home of record? Or, or yeah, or I'm back to, uh, back to the States. and uh, Back to Philadelphia? Right? Yeah. And then I was processed there, and you were discharged in Philadelphia. Discharged, yeah, Hospital. yeah. Philadelphia and yeah. discharge, okay. Yeah. So you're out of the out of the service by Christmas of '51. No, no, oh. no. Longer. It was because uh, I I had Christmas with my brother in St. Louis oh, on okay. the way home. Okay. Okay, so you remember that Christmas. Uh, Christmas in St. Louis. Okay. Yeah, and I stopped in Chicago and made love to a girl I'd known, and she'd never let me make love to her. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that was New Year's. That was New Year's. I remember because yeah, she had a date for New Year's, but she let me stay with her and and let me screw her. All right. Well, we won't get that too much on you. And, and she was a pretty nice girl too. <clears throat> New Year's in Chicago, and then eventually you get to Philadelphia, right? So by 52, you're in... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you probably discharged, what, January, February? I think February. February, February you're out. Mm. February discharge. Yeah, well, my the, the DD-214 will show that. Show all that, okay. Mm. Okay, and then from there, you're back. Where was your family then? In Clearfield, Pennsylvania. Okay. Your parents were still alive? Yeah, they were alive. Mm. Well, going back, they'd like to ask the question, <clears throat> what kind of contacts did you have back with the States when you were overseas, even during World War II and in Korea, what kind of contact did you have with your family? Did you maintain it? Letters. Mainly letters? Letters. Yeah. Right. We didn't have any telephone. You know, today they have to go crazy on the telephone, yeah. but now we don't. Then we didn't have. Okay. Any privileges like that? I don't know who did. Maybe some people did. You had good contact with your your folks. Yeah, my mother and my mother used to write, and and I had some college girlfriends that wrote, and, and I I had a few letters. The um, how about did you have brothers or sisters that were all in, or did you? Come my brother was uh, at, at uh, this St. Louis uh, uh, chart plant then. Well, that was your in the Air Force. He was in the Air Force. Yeah, he was an officer. You sound like he had a good job. Yeah, he did. He did. Air Force. Now, that was it, your family, brother and sister, no, or brother, just one brother? Yeah, just one brother. No sisters? Yeah. Okay. Um, on the outside of that, why don't we go back on one of those pictures in Korea. You got a picture of Jack Benny. Yeah. Maybe talk about that, what kind of entertainment. Uh, well, that, that was, I think, the only entertainment that amounted much that I was allowed to participate in, and that you know he had a nice show and yeah. told jokes and had a girls girls singing and dancing and that kind of stuff. You ever saw Bob Hope? You never saw. Him? Didn't see him. What no. do they call that? The uh, USL. USL. Yeah. 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 So he was on that. Um, so basically, your your Korean duty was really a, I'll say a year, and then back, discharged uh, in '52. Well, the Korean War ended when it didn't end until '53, did it? That's right. The uh, the armistice. '53, uh, yeah. 
was later. Maybe talk a little bit, because of the, once again, relating back to the pictures, this area you referred to as the punch bowl. What, what was that exactly? I mean, what was that? Punch bowl was a natural formation, maybe, of a ex extinct uh, volcano or something. Uh-huh. And it was a big, beautiful area. Well, you could see that picture. That photo, it looked yeah. really nice. What kind of fighting went on around there? Oh, infantry and artillery. And then the area. We had the Air Force. God, I used to... Oh, I didn't tell you we were at Wanju, too. When I, on the way north, while I was still in the... Uh, in the Charlie Med, we took over a bunch of Quonset huts in Wanju. In Wanju. In, in Korea. Huh? Yeah, and we were there a while and we had patients there. Uh, and we stayed there a, a while. And we could see the uh, army jets going over and dropping napalm on these hills and stuff, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. Uh, they don't do so much of that anymore. No, no, no. Well. But I mean, uh, <coughs> but the punch bowl was a heavily, what, it was near the 38th parallel, you said? It was north of the 38th. It ringed by yeah. mountains, so it was fighting in those mountains and. Oh, yeah. And then in the punch bowl itself. And you were camped there by the punch bowl or in the vicinity? We were on, like, on top of it after right. we conquered that mountain or that hill. I mean, it was. But we, our, our group, you know, we were last because. The company had been so shot up before, they take turns, you know, yeah. you, ha you get the point when it's your turn and the yeah. ones that were badly hurt, they're sort of put to the rear until they can get their strength back and then they get moved up to uh, the point where they have to take the point. And that was the day that this company I was uh, working with had to, t had to take the punch bowl and that was the day that that they that they didn't have any opposition. They were lucky. Well, that's. So you didn't have too many wounded coming back to you then. I don't think they had any. Yeah. What was one? Of, Not from that group. Outside of having to unload the, those those the dead Marines. No. Uh, what was what was one of the other situations in which you were, you know, flooded with wounded or wounded or dead? Oh well. Well, you saw the helicopters. They, when I was with Charlie Med, they were bringing them in every day. Every day you had something. Oh yeah. Coming in. Yeah. yeah. You know, we we didn't. Or in my position, I didn't have to exercise a lot of uh, medical expertise. You know, I'd basically have guys going here and here, and there were people there to take care of. You were the receiving, so, you were on the receiving agency. Yeah, agent. and... and Did you uh, classify them how injured, serious, or what? I didn't have to do that either. No. no we had doctors that checked them out. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh... The, uh... You know, so... But, uh... You know, I... I had to tell the corpsman what to do and this and that, but... Yeah. But I didn't have to. I don't. I don't remember changing many bandages or anything like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know, some of the people that came in were pretty badly hurt. Some guys were blinded and sure. so forth. Yeah. You know. The, Grenade wounds, artillery, and then uh, small arms fire. Yeah. 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 The um, anything else that we haven't covered? Do you think we should touch on? Oh. A uh, significant thing that happened in Japan, uh, this uh, friend of mine, Bob Bailey, and I went out on Liberty, and one night we were in this very nice restaurant in Kamakura, which is where the giant Diabutsu is, you know, maybe 20 feet high. And uh, that's quite a sight, and Kamakura is a beautiful little town. And in this restaurant, we met some Jap some older Japanese, maybe in their fifties, and uh, they invited us to their home, and uh, we found out that this lady was Countess Shibusawa, and her father, I believe, 
is called, or was called, the father of modern Japan. And there's a big place built in his honor near Tokyo now. It's like a museum. And he was he was one of the big wheels in Japan. Before Japan. But not anyway. he wasn't in the military or anything. Yeah. He was part of McGovern set up or <coughs> yeah. when he tried to set up this. But he wasn't living then. But oh. this was his daughter and her husband who was president of one of the universities. So they were very nice to us and they could speak English and mm -hmm. you know, like any well educated person yeah. could. And uh, she invited us to a society dance. We had Prince Mikasa's tickets. <laughs> so we went to this dance, but here we were stuck in the Marine uniform, which you know they didn't love that very much. But uh, we danced and and I I looked into the, the Shibasawas and, and he was quite a guy. And his his daughter, I think she was his daughter. She was a very nice lady, yeah. real cultured. And uh, she had a sister at this dance, and we danced with her. But, uh, Sounds like a nice experience. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, we were just kids without any social connections. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that's quite a step. Um, getting back here now, just kind of closing out, uh, you, you belong to the, the local VFW for the last five years. Do you belong to any other veterans organization? I belong to some legions, but I was never in that area long enough to yeah. really get acquainted. To. I would belong, I don't know if I even belong to the one in Clearfield where my hometown was, okay. but I could always go there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, after you got out, now, Final discharge from from the well, Marine Corps. Um, what was your? When did you get back to work, or what did you do there? Well, the fact that I had worked for Ingersoll Rand before, I contacted them because I still wanted that job as a sale, air tool sales engineer, and uh, they sent me to uh, Athens, Pennsylvania, where they had a factory and they had a training program there, and they taught you all about the tools and how they were made and so forth, and and I was there probably, hmm, I don't know, maybe a month, and then they assigned me to the New York office on 11 Broadway, and uh, after I, and then while I was there, one of the clerks got sick, and I had to take over his job, and uh, eventually uh, they sent me to. Uh, Hartford. He came up to Hartford. Okay. Yeah. Well, Ingersoll Rand hired you back then, immediately. Yeah. Oh, so you were yeah, pretty much. Well, in those days, it wasn't so easy to get what they wanted. Right. And I had uh, a lot of it, uh, uh, sort of like familiarity with the company because I worked for them in Detroit. Yeah. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so you went back into them and you stayed with them for a while. For, I don't know, three or four years. Three or four years. And then you went with, uh, what was it? Pierce Pearson, Pearson Company, yeah. And you were there for most of your Yeah, Purse Pearson Company, both of their uh, officers, uh, owners, lived in Avon. Oh, really? Yeah, Bob Pearson. And, Bob Pearson, yeah. And George Purse, they lived up behind, um, what's that? Big politician's house. Alsop? Yeah, behind Alsop's house up on the hill the there, yeah. where they have all the big million dollar homes now. Big ones, homes up there. Yeah, he had George Purse had eight acres there oh, yeah. behind his house. Mm -hmm. And he had a nice house. He had a lot of uh, colonial uh, features to his house. And he had uh, like a, moved a room from an old house somewhere into his house. and. Had all the paneling and all that nice stuff. Yeah, I think we call this name. Yeah. Well, what happened to that company? Still, oh, it's still there. Still there, still up. Still there. Yeah. Well, grandson is run that. Grandson uh, is still in the family. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought it got blocked. No, John Purse lived up on uh, Verville Road or oh, yeah. up on the hill. He lived up there, and and uh, 
he started a company, a software company in Farmington and had like a hundred employees at one time and sold it and now he has a house at Farmington Woods and and another house down in Florida. Yeah, I didn't know that name, but Pearson, I remember that name. Um, anything else? You know, you probably know um, Charlie Kilgore. Well, yeah, from the, yeah. Yeah, well, he built both houses. Oh, did he? Yeah. He was a builder, yeah. Yeah, okay. he was a good builder. Absolutely. He's, he came to the meeting this morning. Oh, did he? Good. Yeah. Um, what do you think, is there any, out of your military experience, anything negative that you brought with you as you still feel negative about? Oh, the only thing negative about the service is that uh, you're often working for some guy that you don't feel is very swift. Right. You know, a dumbass, in yeah, other right. words. Right, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's you sort of resent taking orders from somebody that, yeah. you know, doesn't know beans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, that's, the you have to, that's what you get, that's all. That's all, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah. Not everybody can be in charge, and those guys put their time in, so I suppose they got to. But the, uh, that's the only thing I didn't like. I never wanted to make a career in the military. Yeah, yeah. Although, if I had gone back to college and continued ROTC, I could have become commissioned. But then, oh, I know. When I was in the service there, I th thought, well, maybe I can get out of this and go into something. And uh, I could have gone into in, in, into in naval intelligence, but then you got to sign on for about six years, and yeah. I said I don't want to do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the uh, they always hold that carrot out. The um, you've maintained relationships with some of the friends you've met, so they're still around. Some of them well, alive. Clarence is still around. I've known him since 1945, yeah. and. Um, Bruce Ross died in Florida, I, I assume, and and uh, the fellow in Burlington died, and the other guy in Burlington died. So that's that's the story, as you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, and a lot of the guys that used to send me Christmas cards that died off. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you don't see them, but, but after the war, I worked in Pittsburgh one summer for uh, Carnegie Illinois Steel and and I had a chance to get acquainted with our former commanding officer and he took me out to dinner a couple of times and I went up to his house in, in Pittsburgh and so forth but a lot of my relatives are from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, um, uh, and you're active in the local VFW where is there anybody in the local VFW that was in a similar or, or a unit like yours? Oh, uh, well, now this is Nick Lavnikevich. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's been through this or not. I, uh, Eileen, I think, did pick his... I yeah, think. he he was a Navy chief corpsman. Yeah. And he was in three and a half years, but he was our past commander. He was a commander there, wasn't he? He was a commander, yeah, nice, nice guy. Yeah. He got hit in a, he got hit on Bushy Hill Road by a car, and he was hurt badly. Recently, you know, within the last couple of years, yeah. you know, he was badly hurt, but he's pretty much recovered now. He's got a lot of hardware in his neck because his neck was broken, I think. Bad enough just going through life without car accidents. Yeah, well, he was a corpsman, and I think and, and there's another couple guys I don't know very well that were corpsmen, and and uh, uh, Bob Hunt has become a pretty good friend. Yeah. And uh, he's just six months older than I am, so yeah. we get a lot. I tease him, and he teases me back. <laughs> you know, but... You got more rank than him, though. <laughs> Yeah, in a way I did. <clears throat> but, uh, and Bill Newman, do you know him? Only, I admit, mean, I don't know him personally. Yeah, Bill Newman, know. he's he's going to be the next commander, not commander. not the one now, but we just, our commander, Dick Peterson, Peterson yeah. just 
moved down south, and he's really going to be missed because he was a wonderful guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Very that. nice guy. Yeah. Um, he was a marine, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, he was. Yeah, in the recon group. Yeah. 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 But, you know, not many of these guys are in World War II anymore. No. No, no. It's a few here and there. Yeah. And uh, there's uh, Fred C. Alfie. He was, uh, he was in the Vietnam. Uh, no, not Vietnam. He was in Iwo Jima uh, invasion. He was a Marine. He was there this morning. Nick Grecki was. Uh, and Nick Grecki was in. Iwo Jima guy. He was in Iwo Jima, but he's in the Coast Guard. Was he in the Coast Guard? Nick Grecki, yeah. yeah. He was. I don't know, he, he might have been there this morning, too. Because yeah. we get a pretty good group of guys. Yeah. Well, that's great that they. Ray Zachary, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Ray, yeah. yeah he's, he lives right upstreep from me. Oh, that's, that's right, yeah. Yeah. The. Uh, no, it's good that that VFW was that active, and uh, you know. The well, we had a lot of activities. We sold like forty-five hundred dollars worth of poppies last year, and all that money is used for the benefit of veterans. Okay. Forty-five hundred dollars. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah, but you know, if you have guys at Walmart almost all day long, you could sell poppies by the jillion. The kids are walking out with dollar bills. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well. well, good, Mr. Martin. Appreciate uh, your time and efforts putting this together. Uh, hopefully, everything came out on the tape okay. Yeah. Uh, that's not your your problem. We don't want to be doing this again. But the the uh, but uh, uh, and then any follow up uh, documents, pictures, anything else you think you might want to contribute into the uh, archives? Uh, well, it would be appreciated. Um, I think I covered most everything. Yeah, I think you have. If there's anything you want to add, certainly you can. Uh, well, one of the, our projects, you know, by the efforts of the VFW together with the school board, why we've got on on Memorial on uh, Veterans Day, Day. We, we got the kids have elected not to take the day off. So they go to school and we talk to them at yeah. school. We talk to different classes and have programs I've heard for talk them. About that, yeah. <clears throat> and it's one of the few schools that does that. Yeah. And that's that's a step in the right direction. Absolutely, that's a nice because thing. Because the kids really, because most of their parents weren't even in the war. They weren't even born then yet. Okay, that's right. You know, their parents are like 40s and 50s. Yeah. And they don't know anything about the war. No. Nope. Absolutely. Unless their fathers or relatives were in it, and maybe they heard something from them. Yeah. But uh, it's it's kind of sad because now that we're in this terrorist situation, which is a terrible situation, I, you know, the kids aren't really equipped by experience to handle that. Absolutely. That's, <clears throat> that's a real aspect of. Uh, you know, they think, oh, we could just walk out of there and life will go on the same, but it won't. No. Because those guys are pretty damn smart. Yeah, we got a little taste of that on 9-11. That's right. You know, that was just a little taste. Yeah, and that was, they could have, that last plane could have hit the White House, and that would have really been yeah. significant. Yeah. Well, as it was, they hit the, the they hit the, uh, the defense department. Yeah. Right? yeah, right into the Pentagon. Yeah, the Pentagon, yeah. But that was the wrong building to hit. That was, that was a little too well built, but. Yeah, but they still Capital did a lot of take damage. A blow, and the White House wouldn't take a blow like that. No. Yeah. All right. Good, Mr. Martin. Thank you for your time. Oh, Glad thank you. Glad you're able to do it, and, uh, you know, we'll be in touch on uh, putting the wraps on. All right. I'll, I'll, I've got the paperwork here for the pictures. Yeah. And, we'll and uh, they tell you about how to mark them up and all that stuff. Okay. That'll be great. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm going to turn off the camera now. Yeah, okay.